The 2024 event campaign has begun, so I imagine plenty of you are trying to figure out what premium ship am I going to pick out this year, especially since this year's event campaign is different than the past couple, given that it is actually letting you choose all three prize options uh, when you finish the campaign instead of just picking one. However, there are still some limitations with what sort of premium ships you'll be able to pick up. As always, you'll only be able to pick up the lockbox or promo ships from the previous year. So anything released within 2024, those will not be uh, able to be claimed through the event campaign. But anything released in 2023 or prior, that's all fair game. I should also probably point out that picking up one of these promo ships out of the event campaign, it's just like picking it up out of the exchange or out of one of the lock boxes or promo boxes. So it is going to be a single character unlock. So be mindful of which character you're going to be claiming that on. Anyway, let's go to my top 10 list on what I think are the top 10 premium ships to pick for this year's event campaign. Like with last year's list, you're going to see some older ships on here, as well as some newer ships. The first of which being the D7 America Worker Flight Deck Carrier. This is the Klingon D7 that we saw in Star Trek Discovery and then later on in Strange New Worlds. In Star Trek Online, it is a America Worker Flight Deck Carrier, which means it's really great for energy weapon builds thanks to that America Worker seat, and because it's a Flight Deck Carrier, it has two hangar bays. It also has a 5-3 weapons layout, which is always preferable to a 4-4 layout. And as a nice added bonus, this thing also has a Battle Cloak. So, while the ship is rather nice, the main selling point of this thing, however, has always been the starship trait, the ruin of our enemies. This is a meta starship trait that gives stacking bonus damage buffs every time you kill an enemy. The individual stacks aren't that high, but the real power in this trait is how high you can stack it up, having a maximum of 100 stacks. The only downside to this trait is that it's not great on single target builds like beam overload or rapid fire or surgical strikes. With Star Trek Online, using AoEs to kill things like torpedo builds or uh, fire at will or scatter volley has always been more effective in actually killing things all at once. So if you're more into single target builds, you probably don't have to bother with this trait. However, if you like multi-targeting builds, like I said, like FA, CSV, or torp builds, this is a very powerful Starship trait for builds like that. So aside from that downside of the Starship trait not being great for single target builds, there's also another downside in the second specialization seat it only being a lieutenant level command seat, which at the lieutenant level, command really isn't going to offer you all that much, especially for an energy weapon build. I mean, there's overwhelm emitters to siphon off shield energy, but it's really not going to do all that much, or a rally point marker to help give some heals to your pets and your allies and yourself. You could technically use concentrate firepower, but you generally want to use concentrate firepower 3, which you're not going to have room for on this. So yeah, unfortunately you're not going to get much out of that command seat, but on the upside it is also a universal seat, so you've got some flexibility there still. Oh, I also forgot to mention with this ship, having these will also grant you access to the Advanced Disruptors and Advanced Phasers, which are unique beam weapons that have a powerful proc on them that will allow you to stack crit severity. The only downsides there are that they only stack up to six times, and that they only come in beam arrays, so no dual beam banks and no cannons. Another thing worth noting is that this ship is also available in the MUDS Disco Inferno bundle. I know MUDS bundles are very expensive and not for everyone, but if you do have that kind of spending money, that might be a better route for you because that way you'll be able to get this ship and its trait unlocked on your whole account, and you'll also unlock the Federation counterpart to this ship along with it, the Constitution America Worker Flight Deck Carrier. The Constitution version has virtually identical stats, it just doesn't have the Battle Cloak, but it also has a different trait in console, and that's why the D7 won out on the list, because it's the one with the Meta Starship trait. That bundle also includes the Baul Sentry Ship, which is not on this list this year, but is still a very good ship and comes with a really great console if you like anti-proton builds. Next up is the Deimos Pilot Destroyer. This is a small, nimble ship, just like you'd expect out of any pilot ship. It has a 5-2 weapons layout and a secondary intel seat, so it's pretty good for energy weapons. It has a good amount of engineering seating for an escort, so it's good for isomags. But this is another one where the main selling point is really the console it comes with, Immolating Phaser Lance. On its own, this console is very powerful for a phaser build dealing a powerful amount of phaser damage in one hit, which can charge up every 5 seconds and store a maximum of 6 charges. However, this thing enters into more of the DPS meta when it's paired with the Starship trait from the Crossfield refit. Synthetic Good Fortunes, which builds up a good amount of crit chance and crit severity every time you activate a universal console. Immolating Phaser Lance's quick recharge time make it really nice for building up stacks for that Starship trait. The big downside there is that you actually have to have the Crossfield Refit in order to pair those two together, and the Crossfield Refit is an entirely different lockbox ship, so yeah, that's not going to be uh, a cheap method of building up DPS. 
but like I said, even on its own, this console is still really nice for phaser builds. Specifically, forward-facing phaser builds, like Cannon Scatter Volley or Beam Overload with Dual Beam Banks. Because this thing does have a forward 90 degree arc, so it's not going to be great for broadsiders, but for forward-facing phaser builds, it's really nice. The only other downside of the ship is that it is a bit heavy in the engineering seating. Having a lieutenant commander level engineering seat, I really wish they had made that a lieutenant level engineering seat and then bumped the science seat up to lieutenant commander, but what can you do? Still a solid ship with a really good console on it. Like with the D7, it is also worth bringing up that this is also in a MUDS bundle, specifically in the MUDS fighter pilot bundle. So if you have that kind of cash and would rather get this thing unlocked on your whole account, that is an option. The next ship on the list is the Cheval Temporal Science Spearhead. Honestly, I'm surprised this ship isn't more popular than it currently is, because this is a solid EPG boat. A Temporal Spearhead with a secondary command seat, this thing is fantastic for a Cytorp build. Temporal seating is always good for EPG because you have more abilities dealing certain types of exotic damage and abilities that will generate anomalies. Command seating is good for the torpedoes because you got Concentrate Firepower. This one's actually a Lieutenant Commander seat, so you'll be able to get full Concentrate Firepower 3. It only has an Ensign level engineering seat, which is exactly how much engineering seating you want on an EPG build, because it gives you room to use emergency power to auxiliary power, and nothing else is needed because nothing else is really great for EPG from engineering. It is a bit tactical heavy, but that's fine, that's just going to help the torpedoes, as will the 4-3 weapons layout that this thing has because it's a spearhead, meaning you'll have more room for one additional torpedo compared to most science ships. It also has an interesting trait and console on it. I mean, neither are super amazing, but they are interesting. Both are tied into shields, which back in the day I would have laughed at, but these days, shields have come a long way since then. The trait is good for generating large, small bursts of crit chance. Your shields do have to be over 80% for it to apply, but at the same time, it is pretty easy to keep shields up these days thanks to the Valdor console being unbound. And the console in this thing is a really nice support tank console. I know, I'm sure there are plenty of people that are still going to say that the Vern is better, but I've always had a soft spot for this ship just because... I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that it's a Vulcan ship, which we have very few of in the game. Maybe it's because it's a lower deck ship. Y'all know how much I love lower decks. Really, I think I'm just tired of the Vern being the end-all be-all of all science ships after all these years. EPG needs some better variety in ships, and to me, this looks more fun than the Vern. But, however, for the downsides, this does only have four science console slots, which I feel like would probably mark it down for some people. I imagine some people are going to want to be able to stack as many science consoles as they can on an EPG build. So you are going to have one less science console than you would on other science ships, but at the same time, it is room for another universal console. And the other thing is that it is a very large, very slow ship, which is not going to appeal to a lot of people. The thing only has a turn rate of about 7.5, so it is going to handle like a very large boat. Next on the list is the Excelsior 2 Intel Heavy Cruiser. This is a nice ship overall, but it really does have its ups and downs. It is a full Intel ship with a secondary America Worker seat, so it's going to be really nice for energy weapon builds. Like, being able to use Surgical Strikes 3 and Narrow Sensor Bands 3 on the same build, that's actually kind of a big thing. It's got four tactical console slots and four engineering console slots, so it's not going to make much difference whether you go Isomegs or Vulnerability Exploiters, it's really just going to depend on which firing mode you're using. For Surgical Strikes, you want to go with the Exploiters for the crit severity, but anything else you want to go with the Isomags. The ship also has an uncommon Bridge Officer layout, only having four Bridge Officer seats. Most tier 6 ships have 5 seats, but in this case it only has 4 because all 4 are lieutenant commander or higher. So you'll have less overall bridge officers, but you'll have more room for higher level abilities. My one complaint about the seating though is that I really wish that America Worker seat was on the universal seat and not the science seat. But you know how it is, can't have it all. And while this is a really good cruiser, the real selling point with the ship is its console, Experimental Power Redirection. If you've seen any of my build videos with Phaser, I've been playing around with this console a lot. I know Augie and Spencer have too. This thing is absolutely great for Phaser builds. It just fires beams in every direction. That is exactly the kind of gameplay that I love. Like, genuinely, if you like Phaser builds, I cannot recommend this console enough. It's effectively like Fire at Will on steroids. What it does is set your beam weapons to randomly switch between Fire at Will 3 and Beam Overload 3 but then it'll also activate two auxiliary phaser beams on its own that will deal a special ability called Overwill at Will 3, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's fire at will and overload in one ability. So yeah, it's just beams in every direction. It's great. Now, you could use this on a cannon build as well. It won't change up the firing modes on your cannons, but you will still get those auxiliary beams using overload at Will 3. So even if you're not using beams, this is still very much a worthwhile console to have. Now, if you like fire at will builds, the trait is also pretty nice to have too. 
because with it, every time you activate fire at will or an intel ability, you gain plus 35% to beam damage, plus 30 to damage resistance on your side arcs, and that's doubled if you're in threatening stance. And if you're not in threatening stance, you get a minus 60% to threat generation. It's a decent trait, though I do wish that the beam damage buff was higher on this thing because that 35% is only cat 1. Downsides, uh, this has a 4-4 weapons layout, so it's really only going to be good for broadsiding. And being a heavy cruiser, it's not going to be able to equip dual cannons. And while it does have a cloaking device because this is a full intel ship, it is only a standard cloaking device, so you're really not going to get much use out of that. The reason for that is that a standard cloak cannot be activated in combat. Having to get all the way out of combat just to reactivate your cloaking device is a huge pain in the butt and it's just not worth doing. Whereas a battle cloak can be engaged during combat. The next ship on the list is still one of my favorite ships in the game, the Temporal Light Cruiser. You know, it's kind of crazy to me, because I remember back in the day when the fanbase was still begging Cryptic to actually make a Tier 6 Constitution, and back then, they were adamant about not doing a Tier 6 Constitution. They wanted it to just be a lower tier ship because, you know, it was, like, ancient at this point in Star Trek Alliance timeline. So it's kind of crazy to me to think that the ship is over 7 years old now. And genuinely, this thing still holds up. Being a temporal ship with a secondary command seat, this thing is a very versatile ship. You've got loads of unconventional systems triggers with that combination of the commander level temporal seat and the lieutenant commander science seat. That lieutenant commander command seat is really good for a torpedo build because you got concentrate firepower 3 and that pairs really well with the temporal seat because then you've also got recursive shearing 3. Those two together are going to do a ton of damage. And this thing has a 5-3 weapons layout, and ever since the introduction of the Maelstrom torpedoes, 5-3 weapons layouts has now become the preferred layout for a torpedo build. But you don't have to run torpedoes on this, because, I mean, you can put energy weapons on pretty much anything and it'll work, so you can do that. Because this is a full temporal ship with Lieutenant Commander Science Seat, honestly, you could fit a decent EPG build on this thing. Like I said, this is a very versatile ship. Like others on this list, the Temporal Light Cruiser is now available in a Mud's Market ship bundle, specifically the Mud's Cruiserweight bundle. And again, if you have the money and you're willing to spend it, this might be a better option for you because the Temporal Light Cruiser will then be an account unlock, and you'll get the other two variants of this ship for the other factions, that being the D7 and the Talis. The D7 and Talis have slightly different stats than the original Temporal Light Cruiser. The D7 is mostly the same, but it gets an intel seat instead of the command seat, making it really nice for energy weapon builds. And the Talis gets a pilot seat, which kind of makes the Talis the least favorable of the three. But the Constitution and D7, they're fantastic. This thing also has the added bonus of being the Constitution class. Not only is it the original Constitution class, but it can also use the TMP era Constitution class. So you've got options if you want to go full TOS Space Barbie, or you want to go full movie era Space Barbie. And plus there's the other Star Trek Online original Constitution skins. Of which they have the Excalibur, which is like a 2470s era type ship and the Vesper, which is more Lost Era, or the Exeter, which is early Stow Era. So you've got a lot of options, both in terms of how you want the ship to look and how you want the ship to be built. The only real downside to this ship is that it is a standard cruiser, meaning its mastery package is full of tanking stats and it cannot equip dual cannons. However, that's really not a problem for the next ship on the list, the World Razor Temporal Ops Juggernaut. This is the ship I feel like most of you are going to be going after this year, and if you're not, honestly, I feel like I need to be talking you into it, because this ship is genuinely amazing. Like the Temporal Light Cruiser, this is another Temporal Command combo, so you have a similar amount of versatility there. However, this isn't a cruiser. This is a Juggernaut. Juggernauts tend to feel a bit like cruisers. They're large, bulky ships with low turn rates. However, unlike cruisers, Juggernauts are much more tactical-focused, always having commander-level tactical seats. And unlike the Temporal Light Cruiser, this thing can equip dual cannons. So you can go with beams on this thing, you can go cannons, you can go torpedoes, and you could go with a decent EPG build on this thing. Because this ship does have two universal seats, one of which is a Lieutenant Commander level. So you could use that as a science seat. Fun fact, right now this is arguably one of the best torpedo platforms in the game. Because it's got the Juggernaut Mastery Package, which is much more offensive based than most Cruiser Mastery Packages. Again, you've got that Temporal Command combo, which just hits like a truck if you line it up properly, with Concentrate Firepower 3 and Recursive Shearing 3. And it's got five tactical console slots, so you've got more room for the Spire consoles. Plus, being a Juggernaut, it has an innate weapon built into it, the World Razor Juggernaut Array. Think of it like a big space shotgun. It shoots a big cone of phaser damage in its forward firing arc. Because it deals phaser damage, it's actually really good for a phaser build, but it's also still pretty useful on a torpedo build just because it's one extra weapon that you wouldn't normally have on any other ship. Going back to talking about phaser builds, this thing also has a really good console for one, Light of Civilization, 
It starts out as a sustained beam of damage. It doesn't do a lot of damage at first, but after three seconds, it turns into a heavier beam, which deals even more damage. And if the foe it's hitting is destroyed while the beam is still active, it applies Light of Civilization Core Breach. So its Warp Core Breach will deal extra kinetic damage to other enemies around it. And the Starship trait is fairly decent, too. Activating a weapon firing mode gives you a plus 25% to damage. 25% isn't much, but it is all damage, not just your weapon damage. But if you deal weapon damage to a foe that has been debuffed, has a damage over time ability, or has a control effect on it, that plus 25% will turn into a plus 50%, and it'll remove any such effects from you. This trait would actually be really useful for fighting against the Borg for removing those plasma damage over time dots from you. Instead of having to use hazard animators, you can use this instead. Now, I know not everyone is into flying bad guy ships. I should know, I'm one of them, in fact. So while this is technically a Confederation ship, it can use the costumes from the Galaxy class. They're on the same skeleton, so it can use the Galaxy class, the Celestial, the Envoy, the Monarch, the Venture, the Andromeda, the Cygnus, and the Ross class skins. For some of those, you will have to own the original ships to use their skins on other ships, but you have that option. But like the basic ones, like the standard Galaxy class, you can just use that one right out of the box. So don't worry, you're not going to be forced to look like one of the bad guys in order to fly one of the best ships in the game. Honestly, the only real downside of this ship is that it is quite large, and it flies like you would expect. Only having a turn rate of 7 degrees per second and an inertia rating of 35. Which, funny enough, while those are still very bulky movement stats, they're still the best turn rate and inertia rating for any Galaxy class currently in the game. So yeah, if you're not used to flying large bulky ships, this might take some getting used to. Next up on the list is actually another Juggernaut. The Shrike from Season 3 of Picard. Now, this ship isn't as versatile as the World Razor, being an Intel Miracle Worker combo, but with that setup, it does mean this is going to be very good for energy weapons. Plus, this thing has one additional engineering slot compared to the World Razor, so it's going to be a little more ideal for isomags. Also, it has a 5-3 weapons layout, which, again, is always preferred over 4-4. Because the Shrike is a Juggernaut, obviously it also has a Juggernaut array, but this one works a little different than most others. Most Juggernaut arrays fire off in a forward-facing cone attack, but this one has a 360-degree firing arc. It fires one big bolt of energy at a target. When it hits, it deals a good amount of damage to that single target, but also creates an AoE that will deal some additional damage to any surrounding targets. Honestly, I still like the normal cone attack better, but this is still pretty decent. The Shrike's Juggernaut Array also deals Polaron damage, so it will scale with other Polaron damage buffs, so if you like Polaron builds, this is a pretty decent ship to go with. That said, you don't have to stick with Polaron on this ship, you could go with any energy weapon type. Now, if you watched Season 3 of Picard, you probably remember the portal weapon that it had equipped on it. That is in the game, that's the console this thing comes with. However, it's more of a gimmick than anything else, it's not going to really help you with DPS. It's just kind of fun to use. However, the starship trait on this thing is really nice. Eclectic Collector of Armaments. This trait is actually really useful for two different reasons. One, it gives bonus damage for every different type of weapon you're using. That includes beams, cannons, torpedoes, innate weapons like spinal lances or juggernaut arrays, universal consoles or experimental weapons. So it's really good for any of the specialization firing modes where you're able to freely mix in beams and cannons no matter what. But even if you're using one of the standard firing modes, the fact that this also triggers off of universal consoles and experimental weapons is also really nice. So you should be able to build up a decent amount of bonus damage regardless. But one of the other big selling points with this trait is that it is the only way to reduce the cooldown of innate weapons on starships. Normally things like Spinal Lances or Juggernaut Arrays have a hard 2 minute cooldown. But that's just because for the longest time there's been nothing that ever lowers their cooldown. So far, this is the first thing that does. So if you have a ship that has a Spinal Lance or a Juggernaut Array or any other kind of innate weapon, then you might want to consider getting the Starship trait. Now, aside from the really gimmicky console, the only other real downside to this thing is that it does have a cloaking device because it's an Intel ship, but it is only a standard cloaking device. A battle cloak really would have served this thing better, but at the same time, it's already got a lot on it. Throwing out a battle cloak on top of that is kind of asking for a lot. Oh, I should also probably mention, this is still a juggernaut, so movement-wise it is still going to feel rather chunky. It's not quite as bad as the World Razor, but it does still have a turn rate of 8.5 and an inertia rating of 50. So it's still going to feel rather chunky. Especially for a ship of its size. For a juggernaut, the Shrike is actually rather small. Okay, moving on to the next one, the Friendship Command Flight Deck Carrier. Finally, something for pet builds on the premium ships list. So, this is a flight deck carrier, so obviously it is going to have two hangar bays. Which is kind of given if you want to fly something with a pet build. It's also very engineering heavy, having five engineering console slots, so you're going to have plenty of room for the advanced hangar bay consoles. Alternatively, you could just go with isomags instead if you'd rather focus on a full energy weapon build on this thing. 
Though this is a command ship, so you could also do a torpedo build on this thing. And of course, a command cruiser like this would also be really good for a tank. In fact, if you own the Awani, its Type 7 shuttles would go really well with this, because two hangar bays full of that on a tank? That's a lot of debuff going on. Though, if you're wanting to stick with a more DPS route, this thing also has a 32nd Century Battle Cloak. Which is a lot like a normal Battle Cloak, but its animation is a bit faster. Now, the pets on this thing really aren't all that remarkable, but the console and trait are certainly worth talking about. The console is really good for giving additional critical chance to your hangar pets. And the Starship trait is good for giving bonus damage to hangar pets and non-hangar pet allies. The one downside to this ship is that it does have a 4-4 weapons layout. In my opinion, the big selling point here is the console and trait for all the pet stuff, so if you like pet builds, you may want to focus on getting this ship. Next up is the Theseus Miracle Worker Destroyer. I'm honestly surprised this ship isn't more popular than it is. Having a Miracle Worker Temporal Combo, it's really good for energy weapon builds. The Miracle Worker seating is really nice for buffing your energy weapons, and then the Temporal seating is really great for additional unconventional systems triggers. While it does have two engineering seats, one Lieutenant Commander and one Ensign, that Lieutenant Commander seat is also the Temporal seat, so it's not overburdened with too much engineering seating. But the ship is fairly heavy in engineering console slots, which is good for isomags, so it's got the four engineering console slots plus the Universal because it's a Miracle Worker ship, so you're going to have plenty of room for isomags to further buff your energy weapons. But if you would prefer to stick with the Spire consoles instead, that is still an option because it's got five tactical console slots. I know not everyone's into the look of this ship, I know it's kind of funny looking, but honestly that's kind of why I like it. I love its comic book origins and how it kind of accidentally fell into fitting into Star Trek Online's design aesthetic really well. So well, in fact, that they actually just used the Odyssey hull material when making this ship for the game. While the console and trade are nothing to write home about for this ship, it does have a really neat experimental weapon, Solar Voltaic Array. While it's not the most powerful experimental weapon in the game, I would still rate it in like the top five. Actually, it probably would be one of the best if they gave it a four second recharge time like the experimental weapon off the Cyclone has, but nope, they gave it six seconds. But this thing does have an interesting ability in that it has a 10% chance to grant a 200% firing cycle haste buff to your energy weapons for 4 seconds. So while it is very RNG based, only having a 10% chance to trigger every 6 seconds, 200% haste is a lot of haste, even if it is only for 4 seconds. So if you get lucky, this thing could actually be very beneficial to your damage output. That said, you're probably still better off going with the Cyclone's experimental weapon. Or the one off this next ship. The last ship on this list is the Gorn Hunter Pilot Raider. Now, stats-wise, it's a fairly decent ship. It's a pilot ship, so it's going to be small and maneuverable, and it has a secondary America Worker seat, so you're going to have some decent buffs for your energy weapons. And because it's a raider, it's going to have raider flanking, plus a bunch of universal seating, so you've got a lot of versatility in how you set this thing up. It's also got five tactical consoles and five engineering console slots, so you can go with spire consoles or isomags either way. Really, isomags would be better, because the isomags do perform better than the Spire consoles, and the fact that you can put five on an escort is very impressive. And it's also got a battle cloak, which is really nice. But really, the main reason to talk about this ship is all the stuff it comes with. Because one, and I actually forgot to write this down on the pros list, this thing comes with the strongest experimental weapon in the game currently. Plasma incendiary bombardment is so powerful for a number of different reasons. For one, it fires off in a cone attack, so it's capable of hitting multiple enemies at once. Its damage scales based on the type of ship it hits, so the larger the ship, the more damage it'll do. And it deals plasma damage, so if you're running a plasma build, it will scale off of your plasma damage buffs. Additionally, this thing also has a console and starship trait that are very good for plasma builds. Seriously, the passive on the console gives 20% bonus damage to plasma. Bonus damage from a console passive, that is incredible. And it's not a small amount either, it is a 20% bonus damage buff plus an additional 30% cat 1 to all damage over time damage, which synergizes really well with the trait Complex Plasma Fires, which applies additional plasma damage over time to plasma energy weapons during firing modes. That dot effect ignores shields and scales with weapon power, and if your enemy's shield facing is down, you'll deal even more plasma damage. Additionally, the ship also comes with the unique Gorn Plasma Quad Cannons. This weapon has a 5% proc to trigger a damage resistance debuff against damage over time effects. So all that dot damage is going to be even more effective with this weapon. So while the Gorn Pilot Raider itself is a fairly decent ship, all the stuff that it comes with is all meta for plasma energy weapon damage builds. So much so that with all this stuff equipped, it's actually put plasma damage to the forefront of the energy weapon meta. So if you like plasma builds, you're going to want this ship. Or at the very least, all the stuff that it comes with. 
Now, for the downsides of the ship itself, one, it is rather squishy because, I mean, it's a raider. Of course it's squishy. But really, the big thing that hurts this ship is the unique spinning animation that it has. When it flies, it spins back and forth, and honestly, it can make it really disorienting to fly, especially when you're turning. I really wish there was a way to turn that animation off because I genuinely hate it. It makes this thing such a headache to fly. Now, as always with these top 10 lists, we've got some honorable mentions. The first, of course, is the Atlas Prototype Dreadnought. This ship has long been in very high demand with the player base, but not because of the actual ship itself, but rather due to the console that it comes with. The Dynamic Power Redistributor Module, or DPRM for short. This has long been considered one of the best consoles in the game due to its impressive buffs to bonus damage and hull regeneration. So it's great for destroying your enemies and for keeping you alive. But I didn't want to put this one on the list mostly just because you're really only buying it for the console. The Atlas itself I find to be rather underwhelming. Next is the Mirror Warship, and this is another one where you're really just buying it for the trait or console. In this case, it's the Starship trait, Terran Goodbye, which is really good for building up crit chance. Though unlike the Atlas, the Mirror Warship itself is actually a rather decent ship, but I feel like it does lose some points for not being full spec, only having a Lieutenant Commander intel seat. Next is the Delkina Command Strike Wing Warbird, and this one's here because it is a powerful ship. I know Spencer's really fond of the Delkina, and it's rightfully deserved, it is a powerful ship. A Command Strike Wing Escort with a secondary intel seat. It's got a 5T weapons layout, so you could run a full torpedo build on it, or you can go full energy weapons on it. And you've got that hangar bay for some extra pet support. But I don't know. This one just doesn't speak to me like it does to Spencer. Like, it's a really good ship, it's just not totally into my preferred playstyle. Personally, I think it's a bit too engineering heavy in the bridge officer seating, and the console and trait really aren't anything special. So yeah, solid ship, but just something about it just doesn't hook me in. And the last honorable mention is the California Miracle Worker Utility Cruiser, which... Okay, hear me out. Yes, this is a normal cruiser with a 4-4 weapons layout and double Miracle Worker seating. It's not great. Though it's not as bad as it used to be ever since the introduction of the isomagnetic consoles. This thing already being very engineering heavy in the console slots, you really can get a lot of Cat 1 damage with those isomags on this thing. But the main selling point here is just that it's the California class. It's the hero ship from Lower Decks. And that's really the point I want to make with this ship, is that not everyone's going to be concerned with the meta or what's the strongest ship or the fastest ship or what comes with the best stuff. Some people are just interested in Space Barbie. I get that. I know it doesn't always seem like I do, but trust me, I do. So in the end, when it comes to picking out which premium ship you want from the event campaign, pick the one that you think you're going to have the most fun in. And for some, having the most powerful ship does not necessarily mean having the most fun. Sometimes you just want something kind of silly, like a California class. Now, before we wrap up, I've actually got a new category for these top 10 lists, something I haven't done before. Dishonorable mentions. <laughs> yep, it's the Constitution 3. Y'all know I hate this ship with a burning passion. It's a 4-4 Miracle Worker Cruiser with a secondary pilot seat, and that secondary seat is on the science seat, so you're not even going to get an additional unconventional systems trigger out of Clean Getaway. Seriously, if you want a 4-4 Cruiser that's actually fun to play, go buy a Lexington. Still 4-4 America Worker, but it's got an Intel seat, a Spinal Lance, and a Hangar Bay. And it can use the Odyssey class costume, so it's way prettier. However, I know plenty of you are going to ask about this ship if I don't bring it up, so here I am talking about it. Like I said, the ship itself, really not great. Like, it doesn't have the worst stats in the game, but keep in mind, this thing was a promo ship, so for promo ship money, they were definitely underwhelming. But this ship does have a selling point in the stuff that it comes with. The Constitution 3 comes with unique narrow-angle phaser beam arrays, which are really good for a broadside build. You can equip two on a build, and their firing arcs are a little bit more narrow than a standard beam array, but they are still more than wide enough to use on a broadside build, and in exchange for that smaller firing arc, they do more damage. They're not going to be great with a forward-facing build, so if you like to use dual beam banks, you really don't need to bother with them, but if you're like me and you like broadsiders, they're really nice to have. Its starship trait, Thunder Run, is really great for beam builds, during Fire at Will, Beam Overload, Cloak, or during a Cloak Ambush, you get a 20% bonus damage to your beams, a defense rating buff that scales with your speed, and if you're in Threatening Stance, plus 150% to Threat Generation. So if you like Fire at Will or Beam Overload, this is a really nice trait to have because it's basically guaranteed 20% bonus damage for the entire duration of the, of the firing mode. It doesn't have a lockout period, so as long as your firing mode is up, you get that 20% bonus damage. And the console on this thing, Bioelectric Wave Capacitor, has actually made its way into the EPG meta, so if you like science builds, again, this is a console you're going to want to have. Oh, and the Constitution 3 has a battle cloak, I forgot to mention that. 
It's the one thing it has over the Lexington. It has a battle cloak. Though, personally, I would still rather have the Hangar Bay and Spinal Lance. So yeah, some really nice stuff on a really trash ship. So yeah, those are my top 10 choices for a premium ship for this year's event campaign, as well as a few honorable mentions, and the first ever dishonorable mention. Let me know what you thought of this list in the comments down below, or if you think that there were any ships that I should have added to the list instead, or if there were any ships on the list that you think shouldn't have been there. Like I said earlier, this year's event campaign is letting you pick all three options for uh, for the prize this year. Instead of just the one, you'll be able to get all three prizes. So that's the, uh, the premium ship, the two sea store coupons, and the low buy. So if you're still up in the air on what sea store ships you're going to pick out with those coupons, I've already done a top 10 list for that. And if you're trying to figure out what to pick up with all that low buy you're going to have, I've already done a whole series on what's good in the low buy store. Both of those will be listed in the video's description, and while you're down there, be sure to like and subscribe this video and hit that bell for notifications. If you'd like to further support the channel, you can hit that join button to become a channel member, or if you're ever shopping on the Epic Game Store, I am an Epic Partner, so I have a creator code over there, so if you're ever shopping over there, be sure to use my code STU1701. Uh, helps me out a little bit, and I really do appreciate that. That is Epic Creator Code STU1701. I also have an affiliate link with real merch, so if you're ever looking for Star Trek models from the old Eagle Moss collection, uh, they've got a bunch of those over there, and you, if you use my discount code, STU1701, you get 10% off. Either way, though, thank you so much for watching this video. My name's Stu, and I will see you guys next time.